And we're going to go back to the newspaper review. And uh, with me here to discuss Emma Wolfe, the author and broadcaster, and the presenter and writer, Matthew Sullivan. Very good morning to you again. Uh, good to see you. So let's uh, start off, uh, Emma, I think it's with your story. I need to get up this uh, printout again. Uh, on the Mail front page on uh, gender uh, on documents. Yeah, so this is about changing gender on official documents, such as, um, well, most, most notably uh, passports and driving licenses. And at the moment, there is this kind of loophole where you can actually acquire a new gender on these, on these documents, official documents, passport, driving license, just with a doctor's note. For your driving license, you would need a very simple statement from a lawyer. Um, and so ministers are now looking at possibly closing this loophole. Um, doing it this way, doing it via your doctor who says, who all the doctor needs to say is a medical profession has to state that your transition is likely to be permanent and that um, they have to give evidence that you've changed your name. So it is quite a big loophole and it's much simpler than changing your legal sex with a gender recognition certificate, which is a more, it's a less straightforward process. Um, and yeah, ministers are looking at closing this loophole um, so that it would, it would actually be a lot, a lot harder. This is a kind of worry about just this simple self-identification. Would that suggest you have only actually changed it on a, on a document, not officially, even if most people would read a passport or a driver's license as being an official? Yeah, um, well, I think what the government are suggesting, um, and there's sort of not that much detail on it yet, is that um, you would need a, a more formal certificate, a more official certificate, like this gender recognition certificate. Uh, Matthew, next story we are going for from The Times, and it's uh, about frictionless travel. It's such an interesting story, this, and it's going to affect a lot of us moving forward. And it basically means that we're going to get to a point quite soon, probably, where we don't have to get our passport out when we come back into Britain because it will just simply recognise our face, facial recognition. And this is inspired by a chap called Phil Douglas, who's the Director General of the Border Force. And he seems to have been impressed by an experience he had personally going to Australia where he didn't have to get his passport out of his baggage. So trials of this technology are going to happen later this year, it seems. And it stems from a bit of anecdotal trials from the, the head of the border force, it sounds like. I mean, I think, Emma, this would be something that most people would embrace. I mean, if you rewound even five years, but certainly 20 years, even the idea of having ID cards scared a lot of people. This will obviously require your, your facial recognition data to be stored somewhere, but it's probably something people will welcome because of the trade-off of no yeah. queuing. I think most people, if they feel they could just walk through, would be amazing. I'm sure there will be other delays, and I'm sure there will still be queues. I do wonder, I can, and the minute you said facial recognition, I thought, oh, I can see people go, I don't want this data, I don't want my face to be scanned and stored, and all of this. People are very weird. I have no of problem of, with it I myself. Know, I, mean, I know, I know. I blast myself all over social media. Anyways. I know, exactly. Most people don't have a problem with it, but there's just something about when you say ID cards. I mean, even last night with the New Year's Eve celebrations, people, why do I need ID cards to go to the river, to go to the Thames? Why? All of this kind of stuff. There's something about it that is a trigger to people, yeah. I even mean, though it's your face. It's yeah, not to, a, but to Matthew's point, I mean, private companies already have all of our facial of uh, recognition data, so it's sort of adding it to the government. And there something. is a difference between someone storing data about your face, which you wear publicly wherever <laughs> you go, and actually having to carry a bit of ID on you as you go about your business in your own country. I think there is a, a, a philosophical difference and also obviously a practical difference. Mm. It'll be interesting to see if, uh, if that works and how quickly What about people who've had cosmetic surgery and things like that? Well, presumably you'd have to update your passport photo anyway, if that was the case, if it's significant surgery. I don't know what the, what the details are on that. But anyway, let's move on to the next one. Emma, you've gone for the Telegraph uh, front page. We've been talking about this a lot during the show. Significant. Uh, Grant Chaps, UK ready to attack Houthi rebels. Oh, actually, yeah. this is Matthew. Oh, Matthew, sorry. Yeah, yeah, we, yeah. We, we, we switched. I think you were going to do air, clean air. Yeah, the air pollution one on okay. the front of the Guardian. Um, doctors have been told, well, this is a call for doctors to really consider the health risks and the adverse sort of health consequences of air pollution and to look at patients' postcodes and work out, you know, these fine particulate matters, the nitrogen dioxide, all of these levels of really quite damaging air, pollution, uh, air pollutants vary across postcodes. About 10 years ago, a little girl died um, 
the Great Ormond Street, and there's a, a report has come out showing that the levels of air pollution were very, very high. It can really exacerbate asthma, you know, which can be severe in, in children and many people. So this is a call for those, those risks and for, for doctors to give that information to parents, to carers, to families. Um, it's very interesting. Could even affect house prices. Mm -hmm. I mean, my my area of West London, I think, is, is particularly polluted, and we may get to a point where people actually say, "No, thanks, we don't want to live." in an area like that. As a sort of relatively young dad, I mean, I'm not young, but my child is young, 15 months, I now notice when I wheel him around in his pushchair that the exhaust the level, pipes are the level absolutely at, exactly. at his lungs. And I'm someone who uses my car. I tried to use it less than I did New Year's resolution, use my car less. But nonetheless, it is in all of our interest to clean up our air as much as we reasonably can. And the difference between, um, I don't know, I live near a major roundabout in uh, Old Street, <laughs> and the difference between the air pollution there and then a few streets back in the residential street where we live can be huge. So there's calls for, you know, children not to be walking along main roads to school to go, <clears throat> just to go different routes. It does make a big difference. Some progress has been right made now. by yes. Sadiq Khan, despite all the protests about ULEs and so forth. But I think you can notice it when you go out to smaller towns or villages, obviously, particularly the countryside. The difference between central London and those areas is enormous. But it is worth noting the progress, even in a major city like London, because having recently lived in New York, you come back to London and it feels like you've moved to the countryside. I mean, Genuinely, it is noticeably different that the air quality, something which, which you wouldn't perhaps have noticed um, in, in previous years or decades. Let's move on to the, the, the last story, which I already uh, have introduced, and I can tell I'm working with two broadcasters here because you already corrected my uh, order, <laughs> order mishap <laughs> seamlessly. Uh, but Matthew, let's go to Grant Chap's Telegraph and uh, what the UK is willing to do. Yeah, so there's no talk of the UK being actually at war, but in effect... That, that we are moving to a state of a form of war with these rebels from Yemen. They've been trying to overthrow the Yemeni government there, the government in Yemen backed by Saudi Arabia for some years, and they are trying to disrupt trade in the Red Sea, which of course leads to the Suez Canal, which is an absolutely key shipping, shipping route. I mean, remember the Suez crisis back in the 1950s. It's that important. And what these rebels have been doing is trying to attack ships. I think initially that they thought might be trying to service Israel, but perhaps that has broadened out beyond that. And the UK government and the Americans are saying, enough of that. We simply cannot allow this to go on. So Grant Shapp seems to be giving the go-ahead for British forces in the coming days, if these attacks continue, to actually strike at these rebels. And the, the question, Emma, of course, is whether some small intervention initially could, could spiral. At the exactly. moment, you know, we're not involved militarily in, in the region, but but there'll be close focus on what happens. Uh, yeah, it's a really alarming situation, as Matthew says, is unfolding in a key, in a key, absolutely key sort of flashpoint. Um, but I think, you know, Shaps obviously feels that he needs to talk tough at this point. Um, the, the big thing here is that the, the Iranian involvement, because these Houthi rebels, they're doing this, I should have spelt it out, because they are backing Hamas, because they, uh, they oppose Israel. They are actually Sunni Muslims, whereas Hamas are largely, I think, Shia Muslims. But because they are backed by Iran, on, this is could develop into a proxy war of sorts between the West and Iran because they're, they're, they're armed it's believed by by Iran as well as Hezbollah Hezbollah also in Lebanon very closely linked with Iran so this is this is not a small development yeah absolutely not and it's, there's also an aspect here of Grant Shapps in the UK wanting to step up to back their US allies who have uh, been more proactive in the region uh, as some of these uh, ships have been attacked guys thanks so much uh, for now Emma and Matthew we will uh, see you again uh, in the next half still to come here on Sky News Breakfast